Leave it to Beaver. Starring Tony Dow. All right. Hello, everybody. This is Brian Nelson Jr. from the Leave it to Beaver Facebook fan club. I'm here along with Maria Shaw, our moderator, and also Nick Bailey from Fan Counters podcast. Uh, today we have Tony Dow with us. We're going to be interviewing him. And uh, let's get everything started. Tony Dow, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Uh, it's, today's Friday the 13th. We're recording it. So I guess our first question we just want to know is, do you have any favorite horror movies or scary movies to watch on Friday the 13th? Actually, no. I was born on Friday the 13th, so it's a lucky day for me. Ah. Uh, and I don't like horror movies. So. Oh, okay. So it's a, yeah. Although well, there's sure a lot of them out. I guess they must be uh, the easier to do on low budgets. The Leave it to Beaver Facebook group is what prompted us to do this interview. They have the dedicated super fans in the group that ask those very detailed questions. So hopefully we've got, we do have some Leave it to Beaver questions. We have some non Leave it to Beaver questions that we would okay. get into. So I recently read that the producers of Leave it to Beaver didn't want you and Jerry to go home and actually watch the show. I'm, I'm guessing it was to keep you grounded. Were you ever curious? Yeah, that's true. Uh, it was okay. Were Say you again? Were you curious? Go ahead. When you weren't allowed to watch it to no. see how the episodes got put together? No, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, you're 12 years old. You'd rather be out playing basketball or baseball or something like that. Anyway, so um, no, I, uh, you know, they said um, don't watch the show, and uh, you know we don't want them to think they're funny. There was a laugh track and. Uh, you know, we don't want to keep them as regular kids, which I think was a great concept. What was it like that very first time you actually did watch an episode, though? What, what were you thinking about that? Oh, boy, you're testing my memory now. <laughs> I, You know, I uh, I don't know. When I first saw it, you know, it seemed like it, it just seemed, it seemed foreign because I had never done anything like that. So, I, you know, I wasn't sure what to expect. And, of course... I always am pretty um, pretty tough on myself. So in the beginning of the first year, let's say, you know, I was always thinking, I, sh- I could have done a better job than that, or I should have done this, or because the the actors that I that I my mom would take me to see in the movies and whatnot were these really good guys like um, James Dean or Montgomery Clift or Brando or you know those kind of so. Uh, but eventually, I got more comfortable with it, and uh, it worked out. It worked out fine. I, I never have. I, I don't think I've seen every episode. Matter of fact, I'm sure I haven't, because uh, people will bring up an episode or something, and I don't remember, you know, <laughs> what it was about really. Yeah, a lot of times I would imagine you'd be more familiar with it if you saw it air than when you taped it, because rewatching it puts those things in your memories, whether you really remember doing them or not. Yeah, pr- probably. Uh, although, yeah, maybe. Um, there are certain things that you remember, you know, when you uh, when you look back on it, like, um, you know, the fishing one at, uh, out of Friends Lake or Shadow Lake or whatever it was. Um, you know, I remember doing that episode. And I remember the episode with the girl that was too tall. I remember the episode where I cut Jerry's hair, and uh, so you know there are a few of them that I that I that I remember actually doing them. But uh, you know it was it was interesting because I you know I really hadn't tried to be an actor particularly, so it wasn't like I was really excited about the whole thing. I wasn't not excited. I thought it was really fun and and cool, but. Um, you know, I wasn't approaching it like a like a real job that I had to do really well, or else I was gonna, uh, you know, not the have fire. a job soon. Yeah. So it was, um, you know, it was a little a little different than if you're an adult and you you know you want to be sure you don't get canned. You know, you got to <laughs> behave properly and you got to do all the things you're supposed to do. Well, as a kid, you know goof around a little bit more and have a little bit more fun, which is what the producers actually really wanted. 
you know, we played basketball, we played baseball, we played all sorts of things out on the studio lot. So we had a pretty good time of it, actually. Now, I know you haven't seen a lot of episodes, but even thinking back with the new Leave it to Beaver, maybe you've seen those, you know, at, at some point. But if you ever would catch a glimpse of an episode, does anything ever trigger a memory of something that maybe was going on in your personal life? Like you, if you watch one episode, be like, oh, I couldn't wait to go out and, and do this. Or, you know, I remember I just got <laughs> a, a fight with my mom or, you know, do you have episodes that trigger other yeah. memories from what was going on at the time? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I remember that, uh, we did an episode where the boys, I guess, got a car, some sort of a car they weren't supposed to take on the street and they took it on the street and got a ticket. And that was my, my, um, my car, actually. I started to build it with my dad, but since he was a builder and kind of a perfectionist, I got disinterested because I just planned on nailing a couple of two by fours together <laughs> and uh, he did quite a job on it. So when I guess they were talking about doing that show, you know, I said, yeah, I got a, a car like that. So they had me bring it down and they, they fixed it all up and it was really cool. So that, that's the one that came directly from my life. But uh, I would say that it was more the other way around. I, you know, I would, a show that would remind me of something that I, you know, had done. Um, I guess that's what you asked, though, didn't yeah. you? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so, but I don't remember any, you know, specific sort of things. I, you know, I, I always liked the show where Rusty Stevens, who was Larry Mondello, you know, and, and Jerry got in the garage and told him not to play with the tools. And Larry says, what's this? And he says, oh, that's a drill. And you make holes with it, and so he put a piece of wood up against the garage door and drilled through the wood and the garage door. I mean, those kind of things, you know, happen all the time nowadays and then yep. and, uh, you know, for the last 50 years. So that's what was kind of cool about the show was they were all taken from real-life situations. So you mentioned your dad. This is Brian talking now. You mentioned your dad being a builder. Did I hear somewhere that he did a lot of buildings in the LA area? Yeah, he, uh, he, 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 I think he graduated from SC engineering and then he, he, I don't know his whole, uh, resume, but he, for a while he worked for this guy who was a developer who wasn't a builder, but he was, knew how to develop. So, you know, he'd buy property and then and they'd build, a dozen houses or 20 houses or so. And my dad was in charge of building all those and then started designing and building. And then um, I think he, you know, probably did hundreds of homes that way for this guy. And it was Ray Holmes. So it was, well, that's interesting. It was Holmes Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> but Ray Holmes was a developer. And, um, and then I guess my dad just got tired and went out on his own. He ended up doing a lot of designing and building for uh, people in the business like George Stevens and William Wyler and um, uh, cameramen and various and sundry people like that. And speaking of uh, building, you I've read or heard somewhere that you customly built houses by hand. I have. I mean, uh, our house here, I, you know, we redone it. And uh, we bought it, and it was sort of not something we would really like. So it had drywall, and it had cottage cheese ceilings, and it had aluminum windows and all sorts of things. So I'm I'm a wood guy, so I ordered a couple thousand feet of clear cedar and a couple thousand feet of clear fir, and then just went to work and demolished things and put in new plumbing, new electric, all that sort of stuff. But in terms of... Um, I'm not, I can't do all the craft uh, thing. I can, but I'm not, in, you know, I'm not really very good at it in terms of being competitive or able to compete um, with like a drywall guy, you know, who has all the tools. And, uh, but I, you know, I've enjoyed uh, working on our house here. And I, there was a, you know, five year period or so where I actually was a general contractor and did work for uh, a number of friends that we had and and then then on my own and 
Um, but it just got to me. I'm not a business type guy. I, you know, I just, I, uh, I don't know how to do that exactly. <laughs> so I always felt guilty when I made a profit, which that's a bad thing. <laughs> You're supposed to do it to make a profit. But you did it. But you yeah. you did it as more of a fun thing, kind of like a hobby. So like you work on your no. homes. No, that was that was a was a bit you know a business. I had I had a friend in the army or in the yeah in the National Guard who had his dad's um, painting company, and his painting company had, was one of the first companies in Los Angeles painting company. So it had been around a long time, and his son sort of had this group of guys. I mean, there were probably only three of us or so. And we did all these kind of fun, you know, fun jobs. And, uh, and then we started, that was about the time they were doing super graphics. I don't know if you know what those are, but they're these big graphic things on the side of buildings or on the halls and things like that. So we designed those and, um, did those. And then, uh, <clears throat> And there was a job, a guy that we did a lot of work for wanted offices inside of a warehouse. So I designed uh, uh, a set of offices, um, and uh, they came out really cool. So I started designing uh, stuff. I, you know, when somebody come to me, they ask questions like they always do, and then I, you know, tell them that I can design it. Um, but I need to know more about what they. What their how they what their lifestyles like and how they they want to use their home or their office or whatever it is. So uh, then I started designing and building. And of course, the better I got at designing, I was designing things that were really hard to build, and they were really expensive to build if I hired an outside contractor. So I started doing those myself, and uh, so it was kind of a hard way to go, but I enjoyed it. Um, and then it just got <laughs> got to be too much. Yeah, after a while, it gets to be harder and, <laughs> and harder to do things like that. Going, going. Yeah, well, it's a lot. Of, you know, it's labor. I mean, I, you know, I'd be up at uh, at the lumber yard by seven o'clock and uh, getting a lumber list ready and driving it clear across town, which took an hour, hour and a half, or whatever, and then work on the job and you know get home at six or so and then I'd have to go in and work on designs and then I'd have to call, call you know call people it's just you know you need to have a, an infrastructure and a process you know you can't just kind of wing it like I was trying to do switching gears a little bit we'll uh, talk about the uh, the series I know I I personally asked you this uh, a few weeks ago when you were in Illinois a lot of the fans would mm-hmm. like to know what your what the color of your high school sweater was in real life ah yeah it was a uh, royal blue with gold um stuff you know like a gold letter and gold armbands and um yeah it was and then and then it, when we did the newly with the beaver they did uh they made the sweater a kind of a light blue with black um letters and friends i think but you know you'd know more about that than i do because i <laughs> um i think the new leave it to beaver it was a light blue wasn't it the the new remember? leave it to beaver was like a royal blue with the with the gold letter and then the mystery is what the old one looked like in the old series where it appears on the screen on a black and white screen it appears like a gray and then the letter okay, then. appeared black I got it backwards. Yeah, I got it backwards. Then. The uh, the letter was kind of a gray blue, uh, you know, light blue mm-hmm. with black letters. <laughs> That's funny. I got the whole thing backwards. Can I jump in since we're talking about color? Go for it. Yeah. I want to ask Tony that controversial question that we are always fighting about in the fan group, all 14,000 of us. Um, how do you feel about colorization do you have a strong feeling either way as to distributing or turning the entire series into color? Um, I actually uh, presented that as part of a package one time to Universal. I thought it, I thought it would be a good way to get a whole new generation because one of the things that 
kids were saying, uh, this was, you know, 30 years ago or so, uh, was they, they, it was hard to stay with the show because it was black and white and they weren't used to black and white. Correct. And uh, I don't have a, <clears throat> I mean, if you're going to talk about things like on the waterfront or, you know, these uh, art, these beautiful pieces of art film, uh, then I say you don't screw with them. But um, well, a TV show, I think you just get um, more people enjoying it. And uh, it would be interesting to see because the colorization nowadays is really good when you see it. Couldn't agree more. A lot of people, a lot of people would say, "Wow, you can't do that. You can't take a classic like that and colorize it, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera." But I just think that it, you know, would give an added dimension. Yeah, I totally agree with that one because you know it could be available in black and white, and yeah. the ones that don't want to see the color ones, they can watch the black and white ones, and the color ones are available for the ones that would like to see it in color. I oh, love the black make and the black and white ones more more valuable, I would think, because uh, they are <laughs> the lighting on them and the, you know it's really beautifully done. Uh, we had great people because that was right at the time that um, it was a transition from uh, film to television, and so we were sort of in the golden age of television and all these terrific cameramen and uh, uh, set designers and production designers, all that kind of stuff were really, really good. And um, so the show looked really good in, in the black and white. I think they did a good job on it. So it would always be the value of the black and white. Tony, another detail comes to us from Brian Burroughs. He was always fascinated with the way that your character punched the pillow before you went to sleep. So he's wondering, is that something that you already did or is that the direction that you were given? Boy, you're taking it back, aren't you? Well, I told um, you these are detailed I don't, questions. I don't remember, but it wouldn't surprise me if it wasn't a direction from Norman Tokar. Um, Tokar was uh, this really fantastic director, and he did the first hundred episodes. And he was one of Disney's top directors. He did. Uh, now I'm probably going to be wrong about the shows he did, but like Old Yeller and you know, a, a bunch of things that would, he was one of their top directors. And, uh, he, um, he always liked to put, um, action or have us do things other than just stand and talk. You know, I mean, he would, that's why he gave Larry Mondello a bit, an apple to chew on. You know, I mean, that was a great bit. It was a great thing for his character. And it also, um, made the scene more interesting because yeah. he's doing something, you know, and he, could, it could give him things to do with the apple anyway. So I would say, if I had to guess, because I don't remember myself punching a pillow, I would say that Norman Tokar suggested doing that um, before we went to bed. <laughs> Never thought about it, really, but now that you bring it up. One of the things that my audience is always fascinated with is the actual life of a celebrity themselves. And as a child, you were thrust into the spotlight where you might go to the grocery store and be recognized. So do you have any fan encounters from when you were younger that kind of stick out as like, wow, that was my first one? Or, you know, fans that were, you know, what were those encounters like for you as a kid? I don't know, because I I was kind of shy, you know, and I, and I really didn't like to create any attention. So obviously if somebody recognized me or if I was in a... Uh, a restaurant eating or something and somebody would be staring at me or whatever. It always sort of embarrassed me. So I didn't, that was the the main issue that, that kind of happened. Uh, I also remember um, if I, this was later, if I was taking a date out and we were having dinner or something, uh, there would always be some schmo who would come over right at the inopportune time to ask for an autograph or ask uh, for an answer to one of his questions that he'd always been curious about. And uh, I was always thinking, gosh, why do these guys have to always come over right when I'm, when I'm you know... You're about to make a move. Doing good with a girl. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to make a move. <laughs> yeah. Have encounters with fans changed over time as an adult? Are you more open to them? Or how, how have they changed from it being a kid on the show to now as, you know... An adult. Well, uh, you know, as the years go by, it's sort of um, 
is less frequent, but that's also because I'm not out and about as much as I once was. Um, I think that uh, at least now, I mean, I, I get somewhere in my 40s, I think, you know, I really, or maybe it was during the re- remake of the, the new Leave it to Beaver, that um, <clears throat> that I got a real fondness for the show and realized what a good show it was and realized how lucky I was to have been in it. And um, so as opposed to thinking of it as kind of a hindrance because it was hard to break out of that stereotypical mode of being uh, everybody's big brother, <laughs> um, you know, it was, uh, I got a different feeling for the show. And I think that uh, also as the age of the fans get older, they do get more polite. You know, kids can be a little tough on you <laughs> when you're, yeah. when you're, you know, early teens and, um, you know, they can be yelling at you and they can, be, you know, they notice you're embarrassed. They, they really, uh, really make a big deal about it. And it was always, it always embarrassed me. So the, um, in the new leave it to be your son, Christopher, he, he appeared in two episodes to get that to happen. Did, yeah. did they approach you for that or how, how did that, how did that come about? I'm guessing they approached me. The first one was a baseball one where the kid, uh, I thought it was a great joke where the kid had broken his arm and it was in this really awkward brace up in the air. And uh, uh, Eddie Haskell got ticked off at his kid and 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 said, uh, whatever, I, I forgot what his name was even. Anyway, Freddy, he called Freddy. him to go in and bat for his son. And obviously he couldn't, there was no way he could do that. But, um, and then he did a show where he played Wally as a, um, as a 16, 17 year old kid. And we did a remake of the Springfield game, which was the game that, you know, Wally always talked about. That was his, the game where they, they won the state championship and he made the last basket. So, and I thought I actually went back and saw that about well now it's been a couple of years a few years and I thought he actually did a really good job in that you know because it's hard to watch your kid it's hard to, if it's hard to watch yourself it's going to really be hard to watch your kid so um, but I thought he did a really good job in that show was his uh, was his arm in the first episode was that really broken arm no 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 that was a gag you know the gag was uh, Eddie got so ticked off at his son that he'd put anybody in, you know, uh, for him. Um, so anyway, I, you know, I, that was a Haskell versus the Cleavers, I think. Yeah, that was a fun show because, you know, we we were out in the park and we were playing baseball and, uh, you know, it was. We went out a lot more on the new Leave it to Beaver than we did on the old one. The old Leave it to Beaver was basically done all on the studio. I think there might have, we might have had one occasion where we <clears throat> did something on a, on a street, but I, you know, I'm not even sure. I may be getting that confused with another show that I did, but, um, you know, the new show, we actually, you know, opened it up and, and uh, did a lot of fun things. On the new show, there's a credit that has the same last name as you do. Did it? Was there any confusion? Herb. Did everyone think, yeah, Herb? He's an editor, and um, no, no relation. Um, and uh, except we call ourselves brothers now. Um, <laughs> he um, he was a guy who was really technically ahead of his time. He. Uh, that was before Avid. I don't, you know, I don't know if anybody knows what any of this stuff is, but Avid is it was a new digital um, editing system, and um, he he developed a, a tape-to-tape editing system that cut the time, you know, a tenth as long as it was when they had to to do it reel to reel, you know. So anyway, the. <laughs> He was a technical guy, and he started uh, that whole phase of uh, digital editing. Although his system was a little uh, simplistic compared to the Avids and the the other thing, the Adobe's and all that stuff now. 
recently we we just lost Dennis Snead. Do you have any memories of him? Sure. I mean, he was a great guy. You know, he was he was um, he was one of the guys that always was on the baseball team. You know, he was always have, having fun with everybody. And of course, his son uh, <clears throat> John did a great job in the show. And uh, you know, he was a good writer. He he uh, he didn't just get the job because he was you know part of the family. He he actually contributed quite a bit to the show. We actually just found out that uh, one of the writers from a few episodes of the New Leave It to Beaver is a fan of the New Leave It to Beaver group, and we there's an episode of hers that she written that was recently posted on there, and is that Cindy? Still? That's correct. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she's great. She's terrific. <laughs> so. She had a writing partner. I can't remember what her writing... you remember what her writing partner's name was? Lisa Kite. That was another one. Lisa Kite. Yeah, yep. exactly. And uh, they were a lot of good shows. Cindy was a real kick. If there was a remake that was done today, what do you think the Cleavers would be doing in the 21st century? <laughs> um, probably uh, running some sort of a... Uh, action thing against the government. I I don't know. Um, There'd be a lawsuit in there somewhere. I don't know what. What? Uh, You were a lawyer in the New Leave to Beaver. I said, so there's probably a lawsuit in there somewhere. I think it would be cool. Yeah, there probably is. Right. 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 Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know. Uh, Obviously, we'd be retired. I don't know if Jerry would, but I would be retired. (laughs) But I don't know what the heck we'd be doing. And it's, we're not going to find out either. I think it would be cool. I think when they made the movie, they sort of put a lid on the franchise, which was too bad. Well, that movie was not even close to what the show was. It was like a complete 360. And it's a little disappointing that Brian Levant, I mean, he was kind of involved in it, but I don't think he was involved enough where it was a good quality because it was pretty much a campy thing, and that's what kind of wrecked it. he wrote it. Um and he he was supposed to direct it, and um, and then uh, somebody came along, Warner Brothers or whoever did um, that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, um, Jingle All the Way. Mm-hmm. That's right, uh, Jingle All the Way, and he got the opportunity to direct that. So he kind of dropped out of the Beaver thing, which was too bad because he really he he knew the beaver show almost as as much as you guys do. And, uh, so he would be the guy who would really know how to, and, and he'd had a bad experience because when we did the movie of the week, which was the first thing that we came back and did, it was a two hour movie of the week. And, um, they hired a director from Canada who'd never seen the show. So that always seemed like an odd choice to me. And, And Brian was really ticked off because, the guy had never seen the show, so he didn't know, uh, you know, the values right. of the show and whatnot. Although I thought he did a good job, but Brian was uh, really, really furious. So it would have been much better because I think they hired uh, did Andy Ackerman do that, or did somebody from um, uh, one of the TV shows that didn't have kids in it much. Did home the, Improvement. They didn't have a kid. Did they have a kid in Home Improvement? Yeah, they, anyway, it was Home Improvement, the guy who directed Home Improvement a lot. Uh, they hired him, and, um, you know, I, I don't know because I didn't see it. I saw part of it, but uh, Brian wanted me to direct it because I directed a lot of things at that point. <clears throat> and um, and I, uh, he, so he, I had an office on the lot for a long time. Uh, developing things and we so he said uh, I come over and and you know first read the script obviously and then he we talk about it and he'd he'd make suggestions and then he said um, you know you got to go up and you got to really try to expand it you know make it make it a movie versus a TV show and so anyway I went up and I did the best I could and uh, he was there and as we walked out, he said, well, you really blew that one. <laughs> and, uh, because I wasn't, 
I wasn't able to uh, sell sell the idea. I would have I would have done it if I was going to do it. If I would have been able to do it, I would have done it as a period piece um, uh, from the the '60s, mm-hmm. and uh, I would have kept the same sort of feeling of the the '60s sweetness. You know, I I don't think there was any advantage to having kind of wise guy kids and that was the advantage in the show we had was it was that the kids and the parents and everybody were um were very nice you know and they they had their problems occasionally but um you know there was no real animosity or sort of bad behavior from anybody i mean even eddie haskell was you know his character was (laughs) was great and the thing that they did was with him which made him such a terrific character was that um, he was vulnerable. You know, I mean, he, you know, he, he, he'd help um, Beaver out, and Beaver would say something like, "Gee, thanks, Eddie. Uh, <clears throat> you're not as bad as a lot of people think you are," or something like that. And Eddie would say, "All right, but just don't let that get out of you know. Just don't <laughs> tell anybody that. <laughs> you know." So he he was he was really. Uh, it, down in, in his heart, he was a he was a nice guy. It was just he was like one of those kids who wasn't comfortable and had to try to prove himself by exaggeration and whatnot. So you know the characters were were pretty. I don't know if they were complicated, but I mean I think they were really well drawn out. Our pages on Facebook. Do you get a gander at those from time to time? And what do you think? I don't think you should ask me because I, I don't know how to get on Facebook. I don't like I don't like it. I don't. I've <laughs> never been interested in it. I have a Facebook page <laughs> that um, the uh, my art uh, gallery. The guy who was my representative in the art gallery. He said you got to have more social media and whatnot. And, um, so he, he took over and started doing that page for me. And it was great because I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do was send him, <laughs> send him stuff. Well, what's happened now is my wife has taken over, so you know you'll see a change. I think in the, in the near future, she's do, doing it now. Actually, she's got a different perspective of things. And <laughs> Tony, did you bring home any mementos from the set? Any props? Anything that you treasured? It's kind of hard to ask this because I know you were. Young, and you were probably not thinking this is going to be a legacy or anything like that. Right. I I have uh, I brought home a shirt that was um, I think it was, but I don't think I brought it home from the series. I think I when I was working at Universal, I went up to the wardrobe department <laughs> and uh, asked the guy who had been the wardrobe person on our show if I could have one of the old shirts. So I have one of the shirts that I wore the most. Uh, I've got that. And I have a trophy that is a basketball trophy from the uh, Springfield game. And what else do I have? I don't know. I was always ticked off because uh, Frank Bank, he had a he had a director's chair, you know, and it said, I don't know if it said Frank Bank or if it said Lumpy. I'm not sure. But anyway, <laughs> and everybody got their chair. And I, I, didn't, I didn't even think about doing that. And uh, that would have been a nice momentum to have. Absolutely. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't grab any stuff. Okay. Um, here's a fun nostalgia question from the fans. It's a double-edged question. What do you miss about the '50s and '60s, and what do you not miss about the '50s and '60s? Well, I, I think it was a much. It was a much sweeter time. It was a it was a softer time uh, in our history, and I think that <laughs> you know that we didn't have all these these um, dishonest kinds of things going on. We didn't have corporations who just wanted to get money out of you, and you know the, the whole corporate takeover has sort of been. I haven't liked that very much. Well, um, because, you know, I was kind of brought up in in that family, you know. I mean, and my folks were very similar to it, you know. My dad was, uh, you know, completely honest. And my mom, 
you know, she if she got the wrong change in a market and she thought she was getting away with something, she'd go back and give them the change back, you know. So it was um, it was it was just foreign to me when people started um, taking advantage of other people and lying to me is something that I just that's always been a real pet peeve of mine because I don't do it so well and I also don't maybe I don't recognize it so well that's one of the reasons I don't like it but but I also think don't think there's any reason for it you know if everybody would sort of stick to the truth and kind of if if they took the philosophy that uh, well if everybody kind of lived the way I live then we wouldn't have all these troubles in the world which I'm not making a big deal the way I live, but I mean, you know, um, I care about a bigger picture than most people do, you know, I'm interested in kind of the whole, the world, not not necessarily the world, but certainly our country and certainly the town I live in and things like that. And what do you not miss about the 50s at all? Ah, what do I not miss? Trying to get dates. (laughs) Because again, you know, I was a little, little shy, and I didn't know exactly how to go about it. And uh, I mean, that one show that we did, where I tried to put my arm around this girl, it was probably Mary Ellen Rogers. I don't even know who it was, but I, uh, you know, I was sitting there and I was trying to figure out how to get my arm around her and I sort of started and then I stopped and this is as I remember it may not have been this way at all but that was kind of like me you know it was like uh, I was never real <clears throat> I was pretty athletic and so if uh, if it was a group of athletic people I got along pretty well you know but <laughs> the dating scene wasn't my favorite not that I didn't have a lot of great dates and stuff like that I'm not saying that but it was just always sort of a tough go you know teenage angst and all that last question uh, Mr. Dow Uh, from the fans the fans would love to hear about the upcoming cruise event in in December have you been a part of a kind of uh, similar cruise like this one before what will fans be able to experience besides of course autographs and photos with you guys and what are you personally looking forward to about this cruise event well i i have never done a cruise i mean i've been on a cruise but i've never done a cruise like this and uh what i'm looking forward to is i love boats i love the ocean i spent much of my life in catalina which is where the boat goes to the first stop and uh i know a lot about it i had a house there for a long time so that'll be fun and just um kind of interesting meeting with you know with people in a non rushed kind of period you know when you're on a cruise ship you're not you're not rushed to do anything particularly although this trip you know you have the first day you're in Catalina for the whole day and then they they sail that whole night and they get the Ensenada and then you're there for the whole uh, day and um so it it is more hectic than a lot of the cruises, but uh, it'll just be nice to talk to people, and uh, it's always fun to hang out with uh, like Paul and uh, um, I wanted to say Barry, but I meant Stanley. Stanley Livingston. Stan yeah. Livingston. Yeah, and uh, and Jerry and whoever you know. I mean, it's gonna that's always fun because there is sort of a fraternity that we all belong to, whether we want to or not. So, um, you know, it'll be it'll be fun. I think. You know, when I asked Jerry about it, I said uh, I said something because I was kind of surprised because he 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 sometimes you know won't doesn't want to do stuff like that, or, or at least I, in my opinion, he might have not wanted to do it. But he said, "No, what could be better? We're going on a cruise." Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I guess that's sort of my feeling too. Tony, I'm going to ask my last question. Uh, I know we talked a lot about Leave it to Beaver, but I want to collect your memories about a film that I didn't even know about until I started prepping for our interview today called High School USA. You played a principal in that film, uh-huh. but there's so many iconic names in that film, like Michael J. Fox and Bob Denver. 
uh, Todd Bridges and Dana Plato, but then also Frank Bank and Ken Osmond were in the movie. So now I cannot wait to see the film. But what do you remember from working on that with those iconic stars? Uh, it was uh, it was really fun. Um, it was a, pi- a pilot. Uh, the head of the, the network, Brandon Carnicroft, had this idea, and it was sort of like a love boat, except it was high school. And uh, <clears throat> they, uh, you know, they got all these folks together, and uh, I-, I really enjoyed it. The guy who directed, I think, was Peter Tewksbury. I'm not sure, but he's a infamous sort of comedy director that had been around for years and um so it was a you know it was a fun project to do but the thing that was that was really interesting about it to me <clears throat> was it came along right about the time that they were going to do the movie um uh i think it was a movie or maybe it was t- the tv show oh, it was a tv show that's right it was it, we already done the movie of the week and we were waiting to sell it, uh, and we got a cable deal with the Disney Channel. And <clears throat> because it was cable, they had to cut everybody's salary back, you know. So I, they said, "Well, you know, we're gonna we're gonna take a third off your salary." So, <laughs> and we're doing that with everybody. I said, "Fine, that's that sounds great." So <laughs> then uh, waited around, and finally, when I got the offer, it was like. I don't know, ten thousand dollars less than that. It, it was amazing. They, you know, the studios—they're really tricky. They're like gangsters. So, anyway, I, you know, I was in a position where <clears throat> I, they were doing a second one of those movies, and they wanted me to be the principal, and I, of course, wanted to do it. Um, so I was in this position where, when they said we're going to replace the Wally character. We have, we have interviews and we have guys coming in tomorrow and we're, you know, they were trying to put a, <laughs> put the pressure on me. And, uh, I, I was fortunate cause I didn't, I didn't have to fall for that. I was, I could have done high school USA, which I thought was going to be a series and probably a good one. And I thought maybe be better for my career cause I would be getting, you know, but I'm glad that it worked out the way it did. And, uh, I thought the new show was a good show. It was a fun show to do. Brian LeVan is a kick. And uh, everybody involved with it, <clears throat> we had a lot of fun. I think that Brian will tell you that that was the best time, uh, you know, he's had in his career. And he's he was executive producer of Happy Days when he was like 27 or 28. You know, he was kind of a boy genius. And uh, anyway, I you know, I thought... Uh, I thought the new show was different. It wasn't like the old show. And uh, I kept trying to push it that way a little bit. But it was, I think they were more interested in expanding it and having it, having big production values because our budgets weren't that high. And, they, and uh, you know, they, they were always dropping our, bu- our budget. You know, we'd have a successful season and then they'd, you know, they'd drop the budget on like by $100,000 or something. So, <clears throat> He was always doing these amazing shows that he directed, and uh, and I got a chance to write and direct. Uh, I think I directed five shows, and I wrote a couple. So that was a great experience, and that's probably where I got my foot in the door directing, because I'd always planned on directing. Gone to school, you know, studied, did, uh, you know, whatever I thought you had to do. Mm-hmm. and uh, But it was still really, really difficult. So when I... Uh, I made that part of the deal when they were going to replace me and I, I, w- I wasn't going to take the, you know, the $10,000 cut because they'd already told us what we were going to get. They were going to drop it a third. And, you know. So anyway, I said, well, no, you know, you guys gave us an offer you cut the thing in the third. Uh, and, um, so that's what it's going to be. So anyway, and then I, they kept hassling me. And I, so then I told my agent, I said, well, then give me a directing gig on the show, you know. So I had a little little leverage there and a little a couple of playing cards. Rarely have uh, any sort of heads up on the on the studios. So that brings me to my last question. Um, and I, I assume you're talking about right now the new Leave It to Beaver where you got di- your directing experience along with your writing experience. Mm-hmm. 
what is it like to be to direct and write well let's let's first say what's it like to direct an episode that you are acting in and second how do you get ideas for writing do you sit down and type out the script or do you do you dictate story ideas how does that all work well, uh, I'll do the last one first. The on the new League of the Beaver because Brian Levant <laughs> ran the um, the writing table, and uh, I would go in and I would pitch a show. And uh, let's say the first one I did was um, called Driver's Ed. It was when Kip was getting his um, driver's license, and uh, and then he borrowed the T Bird from me, and he, of course he crashed it, and. Uh, so, you know, I went in with the idea of how about a show about Kip learning to drive and going through the whole uh, deal at the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles. And then and then he finally gets his license, and uh, lo and behold, he doesn't pay attention and um, has a problem. So, I, you know, I went in with that sort of a pitch. I don't know exactly what it was, but it was something like that. And so Brian said, okay, yeah, I like it. Um, <clears throat> why don't you develop it a little bit more and then come back, you know, day after tomorrow or whatever. So then I went back day after tomorrow, and uh, I had developed it a little bit more. And then uh, and then he, he demanded having like a three-page treatment. So what I sort of did was I, I, I would write a sentence for each scene, and uh, and sometimes the sentence would have dialogue in it. Sometimes it wouldn't. Sometimes it would have action in it. So it made it a lot easier to write the show after I'd done that treatment. But I was a little little bugged about having to do that because I had the whole story. So anyway, that's that's what the writing was about. And uh, <clears throat> and I I I think the only reason I got to do it was because <laughs> it was part of my contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then for directing, uh, you know, for the show, the Bieber show, I was so familiar with everything. It was kind of like it was second nature. You know, I, I knew if you're in the living room, I know what the kids are going to be doing. And I always I always like to give, uh, it's my gift from uh, from Norman Tokar, I always like there to be action, you know, like if they're in the living room, Rather than just have people sitting around on the couch talking, you know, I put somebody in the background at a table um, playing solitaire or something, you know, just stuff that happened. And um, so it, it wasn't that difficult, really. And uh, I wasn't real heavy in the show uh, that I wrote. So it was it was fun. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with all of us. We do appreciate your time. Sure. It was good talking to you folks. Thank you so much, said, Tony. Say hi. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And our best regards to uh, Lauren, of course. Okay. Yeah, she just said hi to, to you guys. All right. Have a great weekend. Thank I you. Yeah, take care, Same Tony. Same with you. Yep. Enjoyed it. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.